see if maybe we get lucky. My gut says no, but that took like four seconds, so worth a shot. What's going on everybody, it's Charles. Today we have a dead Mark IV R32 in the shop that the customer states died while driving and now it doesn't start. So in this video, we're gonna walk through the diagnostic process and see what the heck's wrong with this car. I've done basically nothing to it short of popping the hood and then trying to see if it would actually start, which it won't. Whenever you have a car that dies while driving, won't start, anything like that, the first couple of steps are almost always the same no matter what the car is. First thing I like to do is turn the key on and as crazy as this sounds, make sure the car has fuel in it. I've had more than one car towed in because it didn't have any gas. Now the fuel tank in this particular car does have multiple pieces, so even though our gauge says we have fuel, we might still have an issue with fuel level. The other thing that's super common, especially on this car, is a dead crank position sensor. The quick check for that is cranking the car and being sure the RPM needle moves. Now this one seems a little slow to react, but it moves, so I'm not gonna completely discount it, but we're gonna shelf that as the issue for now. The next thing I always do is just a quick visual inspection to make sure that nothing stands out super obvious. If, say, the airbox was missing, that could cause the car not to start. Everything looks okay, I don't see any loose battery cables or anything like that. The intake boot is on, so we're kind of okay there. Something I did see is this hose right here is actually missing. So this is normally attached to a hose that runs all down the back and goes to our air intake. This is an aftermarket intake on it. So this is actually creating a, a giant vacuum leak. It's part of the PCV system of the car. Oh, I can show you where it goes. So this is that hose that's just open over there. There's some uh, mesh in here in a cover that is like a large oil separator, basically. We have a leak of some sort uh, with that hose being broken. Probably not the reason the car's dead, but definitely something worth noting. All right, I'm gonna plug this up just to see if maybe we get lucky. My gut says no, but that took like four seconds, so worth a shot. Next up, we're gonna check faults. Now, I know some people think technicians can't figure out what's wrong with cars without checking faults. Well, why prevent yourself from using a tool that you have at your, uh, at your access? That's not what I wanna say, but you know what I mean. It's like fighting with one hand behind your back. Silly. This car doesn't actually give you a ton of information with your fault codes compared to the new stuff. Keep in mind, this car is basically 20 years old. We are gonna go into VCDS, VAGCOM if you will. That's not what it's called. We'll go into select control modules, we'll go into engine, we wait, and we go to fault codes. We got four. Long-term fuel trim, too lean. Lean limit exceeded lean lean. So we got a bunch of lean codes. That hose being missing, likely the reason for that. I've never seen a car only have fuel trim faults and not start. So we're gonna go with that. Okay, <laughs> talk about lean. So this is our correction at idle. We're adding 1.7% fuel at idle, which means the computer is seeing not enough fuel. So it's adding a little bit to try and even out the car. Off idle, partial throttle, so this is, you know, while driving, it's adding 25% fuel. This is the most that it can do. This is a big time, a big time issue. So this gives me a couple of things to think about. One, we have that vacuum leak we know of, right? Two, what else would cause us not to have enough fuel to the car? So when we think of a lean condition, it's not enough fuel or too much air. Too much air we would see probably pretty easily, and this would be like way too much air. Plus 25 is a ton. Usually when you see it maxed out, it's because of a dying fuel pump. There are times when an oxygen sensor dies that it sticks reading lean, which means the computer compensates by adding all the fuel, so you weirdly end up with a rich condition. All this stuff sounds like, as I'm talking through it, some of you guys are like, this is, makes no sense. I've done a video on exactly what that means. It also depends if you're turbocharged or not. So this is a slippery slope of craziness we can get into. Uh, something else we can probably look at real quick is going to be our instrument cluster to see if we have any fuel level sender faults. No, we don't. Just let's also confirm we're getting RPM in the ECM while we crank. We saw it at the cluster, but I wanna see it in the ECM, we'll go to measured value, zero, one. Thankfully with VADCOM, you can crank and monitor. 
All right, instant RPM. So we're good there. So now we have a choice to make. What direction do we go? Do we check compression? Our car seems to crank okay, so it doesn't feel like a battery issue. It actually cranks, which means it's probably not a starter issue. We can hear the engine turn over, which means it's probably not a seized engine. It doesn't sound like we've broken a timing chain. Because we have the fuel faults, I'm gonna just blip open the fuel line and see if we have any fuel. I think that's gonna be the easiest next step. And as a mentor told me one time, always work easy to hard. Doing the hard stuff first is silly. All right, so I'm gonna check fuel right up here at the fuel rail. So we have two lines into the fuel rail, one in and one out. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's probably never been off before. All right, clamp off. Now we might get a little spooch of fuel here. These like to break when you look at them. There we go. There we go. So we'll get this whole little twistorama. So we might get a big old sploosh. We might get nothing. Well, we got some drippage. Now we're going to take that. We're going to put it in this bottle. We're going to tape this down just so it doesn't sploosh out on us. Probably not a bad idea to cap the other side. Now we're going to crank it and see what happens? Actually, you might not even need to crank it. You might just be able to turn the key on and see. I don't see any fuel coming out there. I saw no drops of fuel coming out. Order a fuel pump immediately and pray that that was what was wrong, right? No, don't do that. Let's keep going. We didn't determine that we have a bad fuel pump. What we determined is we don't have fuel at this rail. So we're gonna keep that like that. Now we gotta go someplace uncomfortable, like the back of a Volkswagen. Our fuel pump in this car, the, the main pump that pumps fuel from the tank up to the engine is underneath the passenger side rear seat. So I'm gonna do the whole job like this so you can't see what I'm doing. Just kidding. I'm gonna take this seat all the way out. Also, <laughs> Look what I just found under the back seat. Perfect, a Wookiees in the Woods thing. So there's this little flap of carpet right here. Underneath that is a uh, circular cover with three Phillips head screws. We're gonna take that out. This reveals our dirty fuel pump. Actually, these being covered in dust is pretty common. It also makes me assume this is probably the original one at 165,000 miles. A couple of things we can do here, just real quick. Just turn the key on with your hand on the pump if it's working, you should feel it come on. I got nothing. Do a quick inspection. Make sure you don't have any like fuel migration or corroded connectors in here. Make sure that you're not Paul and putting the fuel lines on backwards. Yep, you got them backwards. Really? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so from here, we have a couple of options. Because this car is a manual, it makes things a touch trickier, but really not all that bad. We can disconnect the connector. You'll see we have four wires to it. A big wire on each end. This is our ground, this is our power, and then two small wires in the middle. Small wires are gonna be for the level sender. The big wires are gonna be power and ground. So we know brown on Volkswagens is ground. And then usually red or red tracer is going to be power. So if we take the world's deadliest tool, a power probe, this is actually one of my favorite tools, but in the wrong hands, makes modules go splody. We can do a couple of things. Put our ground on the ground hole and our power on the power hole. The fact that this power probe didn't turn on probably means our pump is wide open. I'm gonna power the pump. Nothing's happening. This should turn the pump on. This should fill that bottle with fuel because we're just deadheading this pump. Now on cars with Paul Smith modulated pumps and modules, <laughs> may not want to do that, but uh, that was just a real quick test. The other thing we can do, since we know which one's power and which one's ground, we can check ground real quick. This tone is our ground tone. This does not mean we have a perfect ground. We could still have a ground issue, but this will tell us if we have no ground. So what I did was I grabbed a pin, just a male side pin that I'm going to slip into this connector. So now I have this little power takeoff. I'm lazy, so I grabbed my clamper and clamp there. Now you're checking power, so make sure, you, make sure you're not hitting anything metal. Now I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna crank this car and we're gonna check for power. So we have power. If you're the type that would rather use a digital volt ohm meter, we can do that too. That way we can make sure we actually have 12 volts 
and not like four volts. So I'm just tapped into the factory connector here and see it 2.3 volts. We didn't see that on the power probe at all. Even though I have a newer power probe, I like the two. Now we'll go ahead and crank it, power and ground. 10.4, 12.3, that's not a ton of voltage. If when we powered our pump, it came on, but we only had 10 volts here, I would be more worried. I think we've pretty much determined that our pump is dead. We might have more issues, but before we can go any further, we gotta throw a fuel pump in it. All right, here is our brand new fuel pump. This one actually came with the level sender, which is kind of cool. Not something super common with factory OEM parts when you get them like from the dealer. This one is, however, a VDO, and you'll notice that these scratch marks here are probably the factory part numbers scratched off. This is really common with vendors. When they have agreements with the manufacturer to supply parts, they also then resell them differently with the numbers ground off. So it's probably a straight up factory pump. We also have our new fuel filter, which, um, yeah, looks like it got kicked around and then retaped. So hopefully it's not messed up. It's also missing the little cap that goes on the end. So good, good job on that one. And of course, our O-ring that we need. So let's go ahead and put it in the car. So back in the car, here is our in-tank pump. Before we go taking our in-tank pump out, let's go ahead and vacuum out as much dust and yuck as we can so that we don't get this junk down in our gas tank. Then we'll go ahead and start disconnecting it. Disconnect your electrical connector. Get that out of the way. We'll then do our fuel lines. You probably want to have some rags or I like pig mats actually back here for this so that we don't make a big old fuel mess. You are opening up the fuel tank. It is going to probably stink. Work in a well ventilated area. Also pay attention to the orientation of these two lines. You can see we have a blue one and a black one. The blue one is the return line. You'll see an arrow on the pump right here facing or into the pump. And then you should have another one with the arrow facing away. So black, blue, that's pretty much standard on all Volkswagens that actually have a return line at the fuel pump. Go ahead and take our connector off. There's a small tab right there. You can see I pushed it with a screwdriver. Be careful, you gotta push that tab in, then you can pull it out. Normally, you can just do it by hand. If you do need a little persuasive assistance, just be real careful. You don't wanna break one of these lines because you'll have to drop the gas tank to replace it. Get our little smooge of fuel, absorb as much of that as we can. I wish there were, well, I guess you could like pump all this fuel out, but man, what a pain in the butt. It's not really a great way to do it. Next up, we gotta take our fuel pump ring off. Be mindful of these lines. Again, we don't wanna break them. So this is a fuel pump ring tool. It sits right on the ring, just like this. You lock it down and you can loosen the pump. A worthwhile tool if you do any of these at scale. If you're like, I'm doing one and I'm never gonna do it again, grab yourself a screwdriver, flat blade, and a hammer and gently, and I mean gently, tap it counterclockwise, anti-clockwise to loosen this ring up. If you go wailing on this super hard, you're probably gonna break the ring or worse, you're gonna break the tank. Probably not a bad idea to cover up those lines in case you splooch a little fuel there. You wanna be careful too, you're not damaging these little tabs here with your screwdriver. So screwdriver method is one way. I like the tool better. This one's kind of a pain to set up. It's not as nice as the factory one, but it's also probably a lot cheaper and more available -er. There we go. Just be real mindful of those lines as you're doing this. And I guess today we're using a combination of both. There we go. Chase coming out. Now this, pump is under spring tension. You can see I can push it down. Just be mindful of that as well. Our ring is gone. We'll get that out of the car. Now we can pull up our pump. You want to be careful not to get gas all over your car. So inside of this pump, you have a couple of things. You have a connector, an electrical connector, and you have another line you have to disconnect. It kind of sucks. So we got our two lines here. You can actually, if you wanna get rid of these lines, not a big deal. Those lines are also included in our new pump. We can get our seal out of the way too. That'll give us a little more space to work. You are gonna end up shoving your hands into this fuel tank. Now we had, what, half a tank of fuel, something like that. The less fuel that's in here, the better off we are. Almost never empty. It's usually full and it's kind of hard to see, but you have three lines you can see here at the top. This one attached to the top of the pump, this one attached to the top of the pump, and then this one that comes out of the fuel pump itself, this one right here, or probably more accurate into fuel pump. If you pull that up a little bit, you can see you have a connection, standard fuel pump style connector and an electrical connector right here. They're both kind of like right here. I think they might even be zip tied to each other. 
So undo your electrical, undo your fuel connection. Don't let those wander too far out. But now we're disconnected from the car. Again, if you wanna cut these so you don't have to deal with the top part, I'm not mad about that. Now for removing the pump, there's not a ton of room. Like it, it's not like Paul fighting with that stupid one on the Jetta, but you definitely can't just snatch this up and out of here. I mentioned cutting these off. I think I'm gonna do that just so you guys can see a little better. If you're not replacing the pump, don't do this. You could just take the line off if you wanted, but if you're not replacing this, don't cut it. So I'm gonna get rid of this. That's gonna juice all over. This is why we have our towels here. All right, so we're gonna get rid of that and we're gonna get rid of this one. Oh yeah, we're gonna cut these. This one wire, two wires, three wires here too. All right, we're gonna get rid of that. Now I don't have that in the way, so I can actually show you guys what the heck's going on. Now that that top part is out of the way, we have one more four motion exclusive thing to deal with. The two wheel drive cars don't have this, but the four motions do. Because we have a saddle tank, which means that the prop shaft goes between the tank, there's basically two separate sections. Right here on the side of the pump is a little tab, this guy right there. Without taking that off, you're not gonna be able to get the pump out. The pump is basically the same size as this opening. If you just lift this up, you can kind of pull it off, pull it up, pull it away, and then that'll come off. Now, now you can get the tank, now you can get the pump out. Before you just snatch this pump up and out of the tank, you wanna go nice and slow. It is still full of fuel, nice and slow. You're also gonna have to work around the level sender. But if you just kind of hold it up like this and let it drain, that is a good choice. I also have a bunch of towels kind of ready to go for when I get it up and out. Sometimes you can get like the majority of the fuel out of these things. Other times it's like, nah, doesn't want to come out. This one seems like one that, nah, doesn't want to come out. Notice I'm having to come out at an angle because I have my fuel level sender. Drop some towels underneath and get it out of the car as fast as you can because that's what you should do. Let's go ahead and get this new pump installed. So this is a little bit better view of this pump and it sits in the car about like this, the level sender over here. You'll notice this arrow right here, right here, faces the front of the car. You need to make sure the orientation of the pump is right, otherwise your level sender is not gonna be accurate. Also, don't forget, we have to connect this stuff and hook that little piece onto the side right here. Look down in there, make sure there's no yuck, make sure you didn't drop a rag down in there or anything like that, that'll make for a bad day. I always also clean the uh, bore, bore, port, well, hole, clean the hole out and make sure there's no yuck in there as well. All right, so we'll take, do your level sender first, level sender in. The orientation of how you do this right now does not matter. It only matters when it's uh, kind of at its final resting location. We'll make sure we get everybody that needs to go in the tank, which is, well, everybody in the tank as best we can. And I usually go like way down, like all the way down or get that pump in there. Now we have to find our electrical connector and our two transfer pieces. So I'm like in the gasoline. Here's our transfer tube and our electrical connector. Normally when I do this, so I'm kind of sitting like out of my normal position. Oh yeah, take this little blue cap off and save it. You might need it another day. Anyway, normally when I do fuel pumps, I'm sitting in the passenger floorboard of the car, basically exactly where the camera is. So the view you're getting right now is normally how I see it. And you don't have my hands in the way. You have your own hands in the way. Cool joke, Charles. So there's that. We need to get that, uh, that lower one on too, that hooked on. Where did it go? There it is. You can actually see pretty well into this tank but you are in gas, right? You're, you're, gas, you're gas hands, Johnny gas hands. Get that little thing on, that's it. Pumps installed. Uh, next, make sure your lines are out of the way. Now you're probably thinking, Charles, you forgot the seal. Don't worry, I didn't forget the seal. I do the seal last. Our pump's basically ready to install. Now it's time for the seal right here. What I also do is I'll take some dielectric grease. This is like my favorite seal lubricant. Get some on both sides of, on two fingers. I lube both the inside and the outside of this seal. That way it slides on real nice. Just like that. You can kind of work it over the pump. Don't stretch it too much, otherwise it might not seal properly. Go ahead and drop your seal in. One of the unfortunate parts about doing this job is like the way you're, you're gonna see it is gonna be much better than the way you're seeing it right now on this camera because you can't see like the different angles, but the view you got now is pretty close. That's what I always try and replicate. What does it look like when you're looking at it the way I would look at it is kind of how I want to show you. Make sure our arrow right here faces front and then, 
that guy down just like that. This is the way I do this. Hold the pump, set the ring down. Take your lines. Can we get it started? No. So take the lines, just kind of set them in place. Still holding the pump down. Tighten the ring as much as you can by hand. Make sure it doesn't twist too much. Now we don't have to worry about our lines getting pinched up underneath. We have everything kind of in the right spot. Now we need to tighten it. You can use your fancy schmancy tool if you have that. The big thing here though, is you wanna make sure you're not rotating the pump. You're only turning the ring. And that can be hard with this one because you can't see. You also wanna pay attention to the lines, make sure you're not messing those guys up. And go ahead and just get that tightened down. If, if you're using the hammer and uh, screwdriver method, go ahead and do that. Some of these rings are metal and this method works much better for those. But as you can see, it works fine here too. Make sure this ring is evenly seated. Oh, my pump turned. Check it out, my arrow's here. Should be more like here, so not much, but enough to potentially be a problem. That's what can happen when you're not paying attention. From my standpoint, when that kind of stuff happens, it's really important to me to show you guys that, hey, look, this does happen. It can happen to me, it can happen to you. It's happened to many a technicians that get this installed, don't catch that it turned. Now all of a sudden they're like, why the hell is my fuel level center not working right? Shows I have half a tank of fuel and it's empty or it's getting hung and never, usually what happens is it gets hung and it never shows that the tank is full. Mega annoying. All right, that's pretty tight. Plug our electrical connector in. First thing I think I'm gonna do is just turn the key on, see if I can hear this pump come on. Well, it sounded like the pump came on. Let's go see if our bottle under the hood actually got any fuel in it. Now we have some gasoline. This is just from the pump priming. So we got plenty more gasoline than we uh, had beforehand. So this is good. This means we're getting fuel up to the engine. Now we can get rid of this thing, put the line back on and our car in theory should start. Okay, nothing to do now, but to, well, see if it actually starts and not run over this tube of dielectric grease. Cause that, that would actually make a hilarious mess. Go. Okay, well it starts. Now we have to put the car back together and I also got a fuel filter because anytime you put a fuel pump in a car, probably not a, not a bad idea. Go ahead and do a filter. As well. Like most gas Volkswagens, this fuel filter is located underneath, just in front of the right rear tire. Normally in this bracket right here, there's a clamp, but we got some zip ties, so we'll just deal with that. I already bled pressure off the backside of this filter. This line is off. Definitely wanna wear safety glasses for this job. Also be super careful with these lines, especially on a car knocking on the door at 20 years old. They get super brittle and you're either taking the tank down to replace the lines, kind of like in the car, or uh, you're replacing them all the way to the front. Both of those options are not good. Get our last little drippage, fuel. This filter should be full of fuel. Anytime you do a, a fuel pump, it's not a bad idea to replace the filter. And if the car uses like a standard fuel pump relay, go ahead and do the relay too. This car uses a pretty convoluted fuel pump relay that controls a bunch of other stuff. So we're not gonna do the relay on this one. We're putting it back the way it's supposed to be. Hopefully anyway, it's kind of a pain in the butt because the bracket that you have to wrap this clamp around is like molded with the tank. There we go, okay, yay. I'm feeling better about that. Here's our new filter. We'll go this way, make sure, make sure that the arrow points the right direction. Otherwise, well, honestly, it probably doesn't really matter on this filter, but some filters have fuel pressure regulators built into them. And if you don't get it on there right, well, you're not doing it right. I don't think that was right. That's the way it's going. Okay, so now we gotta snug this all up, put that on, clamp, clamp. See, that's what it's supposed to be like, not a bunch of zip ties. We'll also put this parking brake cable back on and we're done. Go.
Now I had to go ahead and remove that cap that we put on the end of the valve cover. Having that cap on there can totally disrupt the crankcase pressure and cause some oil leaks and stuff like that. So I had to take it back off, talk to the owner of the car. He said there was something on there. So we'll let him go ahead and handle that once he gets his car back. Okay, there we go. We are all wrapped up. We have our fuel filter in, we have our fuel pump in, we've properly diagnosed it and the car does run. I also threw a shifter bushing for first gear, the first gear getter in it. All I need to do now is test drive the car and then get this thing out of here because we got a Mark III Cabrio that we're gonna make dirt nasty low. Not really, but we gotta put some coilovers on it. And links to everything we used down in the description. With that, I'm out. Have an awesome day. I'll talk to you again next time. Bye.